In this video, I want to dive a little bit more into the different divisions among Protestants in the Church of England and focus in on the work of Richard Hooker and how he tries to address some of those divides. The large conflict we have here is between one group that we would call uh, Presbyterians or Puritans and the other group, um, a group we would call conformists or churchmen. Uh, so starting with the, the Presbyterian slash Puritan view, this is the, uh, they have a range of ideas. Uh, grounding it is the notion that the New Testament itself divinely establishes an, a congregational system of worship uh, where the elders govern the life of the church. That is, there are no dioceses really to conceive of. Uh, there is simply the local church. And the local church is to be run by a collection of elders or leading men of the local church community. This polity is also rooted in uh, a perspective that the word of God is perfect in scripture and is the sole authority in all matters of religion and worship. So when they read the scriptures, especially the New Testament, they say, we do not see in here a system of church life rooted in bishops and dioceses and certainly not popes, but rather we see a network of local church communities in which ruling elders run things. This is the way they read Acts and various Pauline letters. Moreover, they say, whatever we... Uh, Whoever has done worship that can't be justified by Scripture itself is unlawful to God. And so Scripture does not ordain one to say, wear a surplus with a cassock. Scripture does not ordain one to have uh, candles on an altar. Scripture does not ordain one to retain many of the traditional practices, uh, symbols that, say, conformists might want to retain. And so if it's not in Scripture, it's not required. Indeed, it might be unlawful to do. Moreover, it's a sin to force any Christian to conform to such worship if they find it contrary to their conscience. Uh, this, again, is a very... Uh, Protestant notion, I've referenced this before, this uh, rooted in Luther's statement of, here I stand, I can do no other. This appeal to conscience based on scripture. So, if you now, now the implications are clear, if you have a Presbyterian or Puritan church minister, and you compel him to wear a surplus, you're actually committing a sin as a bishop or a queen, by compelling him to act against his conscience. And so you can see how real fault lines are going to begin to open up within Protestantism based on these on this interpretation. On their side, we have conformists or churchmen who want to say, actually, the Episcopal system of church governance itself is divinely ordained in the Bible, that we have bishops right there in the Bible. Uh, but they don't here in this moment in time put a real heavy emphasis on something like a notion of the bishop as a guarantor of apostolic teaching. Uh, that's going to come uh, about a century or so later in Anglican thinking. Right now they simply say uh, episcopacy is or is uh, can be found in scripture and it's pleasing to God. They really argue for episcopacy because it retains good order and is a form of government that's familiar to the Church of England and hence permissible. Um, one of the unique things about the reign of Queen Elizabeth is that although she is very Protestant and really holds reformed theological views, she permits the survival of cathedrals, that is these massive churches where the bishop um, resides, and uh, the patterning of prayer and liturgy found in the English cathedrals that can mirror 
pre-Reformation patternings of prayer and liturgy. This is unique among uh, among all the Reformed Protestant countries, and that Elizabeth does not find these things to be an obstacle to her Protestant vision. And so this places preaching and liturgical prayer on equal footing in the Elizabethan church, which again, in a typical Reformed church, only preaching would be the central act. But in an Elizabethan church, in the cathedrals, the rhythms of lit liturgical prayer are on par with preaching. Now when we get into the parish church, uh, preaching again takes center stage, and liturgical prayer uh, is is designed to help support it. But in the cathedrals, uh, that dual emphasis is retained. And this is something that's really heavily defended within a conformist perspective. Beyond this, beyond a debate about forms of government and what is permissible in church worship, the conformists or churchmen are themselves fairly Calvinist in their own theology, fairly reformed. So what we can speak to a general uh, reformed consensus within the Protestantism of the Church of England. On the ground, there's actually a wide variety of local religious Christian expression. We have people that we can describe as Puritans. They want to push the Reformation further, make it look more like, say, Calvin's Geneva. Uh, we have your recusants, your folks who are not really going to show up to church and in the privacy of their households, try to retain the old Roman Catholic ways of worship. We have folks called church papists. A church papist is someone who secretly holds to uh, Roman Catholic beliefs, but shows up to worship at the Church of England's parish because it's legally required. And so they outwardly conform. And then we have people called conformists or churchmen, those who want to really adhere and uphold the Church of England as uh, Elizabeth and uh, the bishops envision it. Again, one of the important things here is that Elizabeth really is concerned about outward compliance in worship. That is, she wants everyone to show up to the same parish church at the same time and say the same prayers. And she doesn't want any debate over religion. She wants the church to be unified in its worship so the country can be unified politically. So it's a co-inherence of church and state in this way. She really wants to emphasize then, we could say, affiliation over affirmation. She wants everyone to attend to the same place and do the same thing. And she is not as concerned about how strongly they would affirm uh, the official beliefs of the Church of England. But as I've said before, as a whole, the Church is Reformed Protestant in its outlook. And they don't think of themselves as something called Anglican. And this is, might be shocking to all of you. But Anglican as a meaningful category only begins to emerge in the late 17th and early 18th century um, and we're going to explain uh, why that is when we get to that next week. But it doesn't make sense to call, actually, the Elizabethan Church Anglican uh, as a category it would apply to itself. Rather, we'd, we would want to describe it as Reformed Protestant in its official teachings. What Elizabeth is very good at, then, is by insisting over decades that people do the same thing, show up at the same place, and pray from the same book, over the course of those decades and generations, people gradually become used to Protestantism. And because she lives a long time, that also means that there's no disruption in the consensus she seeks to build. And so the Elizabethan settlement is more, I, I would say, about Elizabeth playing a long game of conformity and seeking to keep a lid on all the divisions that are boiling beneath the surface. But those divisions are there, and they're going to burst out in a big way when we get to the English Civil War next week. 
no theologian better represents um, Elizabeth's uh, desires and a trajectory the Church of England is going to take than Richard Hooker. Uh, he is uh, the paramount Anglican theologian. Um, he is very reformed if you examine his theology, but he warns against the dangers of Puritanism for the Church of England. He says this real kind of sectarian emphasis that Puritans want to put on, that there's only one right way to do things. He says it's very dangerous for a common life. And he wants to argue for the appropriateness of context, that what might work well in Geneva isn't going to work well in Canterbury. And so what's right for England might not be right for another country. Hooker represents a trajectory towards an Anglican theology that becomes more pronounced in the mid-17th century. So he's an important beginning of a chain of teaching that helps Anglicanism become its own distinctive voice later on. I want to focus on three hallmarks of Hooker's theology here with you today. Um, one is his notion of scripture. And part of what Puritans and Presbyterians want to say is everything can only be decided by scripture alone. And he says, well, that might not be entirely true. I mean, he affirms that uh, scripture is um, the pinnacle of God's revelation and the ultimate source of authority. But scripture doesn't speak on all matters. Uh, for instance, scripture doesn't, as he argues, scripture doesn't speak clearly on issues of polity, on how to organize the church. Similarly, scripture um, doesn't fully lay out a Trinitarian doctrine or Christological doctrine. Certainly, it provides all the pieces, but takes the life of the church time to discern things. So scripture then needs to cooperate with other elements, and those other two other elements um, are reason and tradition. Now, many of you have probably heard of Richard, Richard Hooker's three-legged stool, the notion that there's three legs of Anglican teaching, uh, scripture, reason, tradition. Um, first of all, I hate to break this to you, but he never talks about a stool anywhere in the laws of ecclesiastical polity, his uh, hallmark work. Uh, I read the whole thing. It's not there. It's an idea developed sometime in the 19th century. Instead, Richard Hooker gives you a big wheel. You all know what a big wheel is? A little kid's uh, trike. He right? has one big wheel in the front and then two smaller wheels in the back. So we want to think of Scripture as the big wheel that moves everything along and reason and tradition as the two wheels in the back. Richard Hooker gives you a tricycle, people. You need scripture, reason, and tradition working together to clearly discern the needs of the church in specific contexts. But scripture is always primary and reason and tradition aid in the interpretation of scripture. Now, I want to say something to you here. You're going to say, but I like the adding the category of experience here too. Richard Hooker does include experience or context, and thus this isn't working for me. Uh, reason is contained for him in those categories of uh, experience or context. This is a pre-enlightenment definition of reason, which is the taking in here of all experience, all human reality really, reflection on it, and then application. So the word reason is actually doing a lot of work in Hooker's thinking. There's one place where Hooker really kind of, I think, puts together these three categories well. Uh, this is in book five, chapter eight of the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, where he says, what scripture doth plainly deliver, to that the first place both of credit and obedience is due. The next whereunto is whatsoever any man can necessarily conclude by force of reason. After these, the voice of the church succeedeth. Okay, so what does that mean? If we're trying to discern an issue, a debate, let's look first at scripture. 
Scripture is the primary source of authority for Richard Hooker. In other words, Scripture is the primary source of authority for Anglicans. Why? Because they're Christian. To that first place, Scripture, if Scripture says this is how we deal this issue, go ahead. Great. We do it. But, if not, then we need to sort these things out by other means. So, what's the best form of church governance? Then we need to deploy reason, which is reflection and application in terms of context and lived reality. If that can't answer the question, then we also also look to what church tradition teaches. So we use these different data points to begin to discern a plain and clear decision for a church in a local context. So this is a method. <clears throat> this is a form of hermeneutics. I think it works very well. Uh, it can be applied contextually. And so one of the things we can begin to see is that Anglicanism is going to eventually develop as a religion, a form of Christianity that em emphasizes uh, being Christian in context, both this form of teaching from Hooker, Article 34 of the Thania Articles I mentioned in the previous video. Alongside all this, here's a third thing Hooker teaches, and this regards sacraments. That sacraments is part of what is at the center of Christian community and what binds Christian community together. So he says, sacraments are the powerful instruments of God to eternal life. And sacraments are things that we get access to through the ceremonies and laws or the polity of the Church of England. So he wants to argue with Puritans, we don't really need a church to change the Church of England because it's providing for us all the things that we need. And these sort of kernels of Hooker's insights um, are going to be very informative and generative for Anglicanism as it develops over time. So I hope this has been a useful survey of the Elizabethan reign. Um, in the next video, we are going to transition to looking at the early Stuart monarchs of James I and Charles I.